Homes, businesses, factories, parks, roads, and schools. These places and more all make up our towns and cities. They're called land uses because, well, they take up space on urban land. One of the most critical tasks communities must do is help decide where all of these land uses should go. Does a factory belong next to a school or a park instead? How big should those things be? These are questions that land use planning tries to answer. Cities can use lots of different tools to help answer these land use questions, but I'll be talking about the most common ones in this video. They include zoning codes, comprehensive plans, and regional plans. Let's start with one of the most fundamental, zoning. And before I get started, I want to introduce a new series on this channel, the City Beautiful Basics series. This is the first in a series of five videos designed to provide you with a baseline of useful knowledge on five major planning themes. Land use, transportation, the environment, housing, and social justice. These videos will be presented ad-free and are designed for anyone with an interest in planning. Almost every city in the United States has zoning, Houston being one major exception. You might interact with the zoning code when you try to make a simple change to your home, like adding a new room or building a fence. Your city might tell you that you can or can't do those things based on what the zoning code says. In this way, many people see zoning as an annoyance that gets in the way of making personal decisions to change their home. But zoning also shapes entire cities and regions. Let me give you another example. It's probably obvious to you that you can't open up a grocery store in your living room or convert your backyard into an oil refinery. It's only obvious because we all live in a world that zoning has shaped and regulated. The reason you can turn your house into an oil refinery is probably because your house is in a zone that the city government says can have only single family homes inside. No industry of any kind allowed. Many Americans live in this type of zone, and it's one of the many zones that cities use to regulate how their city looks, functions, and feels. How does zoning work? It fundamentally separates part of a city into zones. Each of these zones has a unique set of rules about what uses can be located there and how dense it can be. Local governments like zoning because it creates a lot of clarity for everyone who owns land, and it saves a lot of work for local government employees. Zoning codes also contain development standards that dictate how tall a building can be in that zone or how much of the lot it can take up. Further zoning code sections contain rules about parking, signage, fencing, and more. It really is a rule book about how a city can be built down to the last little detail. Despite the benefits of zoning codes, there have been numerous calls for reform as these codes can lead to low density, car-oriented cities that can cause traffic and generate a lot of carbon emissions. Increasingly, cities are passing reforms to allow for more than one home on lots zoned for single-family housing. Mixed-use zones are being applied to lots more often, too, to allow for different uses to be nearby. These changes can create more vibrant, flexible communities that aren't so car-oriented. Zoning codes are how many people interact with city planning on a regular basis, but the zoning code is a simple tool that implements a broader citywide plan. This plan is sort of a constitution for new growth and development in a community. It's called the Comprehensive Plan, and we'll talk about comprehensive planning next. This type of planning is essential for managing growth, ensuring sustainable development, and creating livable communities. Like its name suggests, comprehensive planning is comprehensive. It can involve everything. Comprehensive plans tie in transportation, housing, land use, and the environment, and it's all bundled in one document created by local policymakers. In this way, it serves as a blueprint for the entire region. All other community plans have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan, even the zoning code. That's why planners think of these plans as constitutions, because they're the ultimate law of the land for planning. Now, comprehensive planning differs between states, and it's not required by the federal government. Each state has their own requirements for what should be in a comprehensive plan. Comprehensive planning is done with extensive community input throughout the process. This can mean community workshops where community members gather to provide input, or city planners going to farmers markets, festivals, schools, and other places where people already are to get feedback on key pieces of the plan. The ultimate goal is to create a plan that has broad support from the entire community. City planners need to be sure to reach out to a representative group of community members. Okay, let's stop talking about comprehensive planning in the abstract and look at a specific example, like this award-winning plan for Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte's plan, like most, contains a section on existing conditions. It's important to define a baseline and understand existing strengths and weaknesses before proposing a new path forward. Their plan also includes a description of community values and vision. Every proposed policy needs to be consistent with this overarching vision. The Charlotte 2040 plan then features policies and actions organized around 10 critical community goals, tackling topics from transit and trail-oriented development and housing access for all to the creation of 10-minute neighborhoods citywide. 
Then the plan includes a map of the land uses in the community. It looks like a zoning map, but is usually broader and less detailed. It usually includes the overall density for each area, as well as a description of the character envisioned. The zoning map has to conform to this land use map. It makes sense for cities to have a big, broad, long-range plan for their future. It gets everyone on the same page about where the city's going, implementing that shared vision, typically developed with a lot of community input. But most of us don't just live in a single city, but instead live in a city that's a part of a broader metropolitan region. Comprehensive plans are for single cities. A different type of planning is needed to coordinate all the cities and suburbs that make up our urban areas. It makes a lot of sense to think about urban challenges at a regional level, since many problems don't respect city limit boundaries. Air pollution certainly doesn't care about boundaries as it wafts through the sky. Traffic doesn't disappear when you cross city limits. And when we think about housing markets, they're usually at the regional level. Regional planning extends beyond the boundaries of a single city and encompasses a broader geographical area, often known as a region or district. In the US, you can think of regions like the Bay Area, Chicagoland, or Greater New York. Metropolitan areas are built using counties. Some regions only consist of one county, while others are made of many. The Bay Area, for example, consists of nine counties. This type of planning focuses on coordinating land use and transportation decisions across multiple cities and counties within the defined region to promote sustainable and integrated growth. Regional agencies, the bodies responsible for developing regional plans, must include transportation planning in those plans, but may choose to add environmental goals, economic development policies, and anything else that needs considering at the wider regional level. Let's take a look at a regional plan to really understand what's in one. Plan Bay Area 2050, the regional plan for the San Francisco region, is a recent example of a regional plan that takes all sorts of diverse considerations into account. Like the name suggests, the plan has a lofty goal. Imagining all nine counties of the Bay Area in 2050 in terms of their transportation, housing, economy, and environment. Taking such a big picture look at the Bay, which is home to around 7 million, enables planners to create visions and policies for systems that wouldn't be possible on a city or county level. Think about the freeway system, or the local public transportation networks like BART and Caltrain. Plan Bay Area 2050 includes 35 specific strategies to tackle region-wide issues. Many of these strategies have incentives attached to encourage local governments to implement the regional plan. For instance, the plan includes $237 billion for the state to buy currently affordable housing and preserve it for low-income households. Another $389 billion is for restoring and maintaining the existing transportation network, while tens of billion more are set aside for building new transit lines, increasing frequency, and adding capacity. The one trick with regional planning is that the regional agencies that produce them don't have the power to compel the cities within the region to comply with the plan. The regional agencies can't rewrite zoning codes. That's why those grant programs are so important. They can incentivize cities to comply with the plan. Even though regional planning in the United States is weaker than local plans, they still serve to coordinate growing, changing urban areas. And that's no small thing. Coordination is why land use planning is so powerful. It just makes sense to get everyone, decision makers, real estate developers, and residents on the same page about how the future developments will be planned. Comprehensive land use planning can also address so, so many serious urban issues. Land use planning can provide solutions to climate change, housing and affordability, social justice, and more. Let's take a look at an example of this, parking. Parking is one of those land uses that you don't really think about too much. But just about every land use has space for parked cars, and that's a requirement written into the zoning code. Everyone wants to be able to park where they shop or work, but cars are big and they take up a lot of space. All that space for cars spreads out other land uses, which means it's harder to walk and bike. That means more people need to drive, which means more parking. You get the idea. Parking can be a problematic land use and ugly too. Nobody wants to look at it. Now, some cities have abolished parking minimums found in the zoning code to address some of these concerns. These minimums require businesses to have a certain number of parking spaces but the requirements were often higher than necessary, wasting land and money. Now, real estate developers and communities that have abolished parking minimums can plan for the amount of parking the market needs, not what the planning department needs. This usually results in somewhat smaller parking lots better optimized for the use on the site. Another major feature of land use planning that's being reconsidered is the separation of uses. Mixing uses can reduce travel times and traffic, decrease carbon emissions, and make for more pleasant walkable places. The city of Los Angeles recently allowed limited commercial uses in a residential zone in the Boyle Heights neighborhood. This move was largely meant to legalize existing corner stores, which serve as valuable community assets to the local Latino population, but they were illegal under the zoning code. However, this new zoning change might increase walkability or small business ownership, which could be replicated in other neighborhoods and cities. In Seattle, a woman opened a cider tasting room in her garage during the pandemic. Zoning complaints from a neighbor forced her to close it a year later, 
but the cities introduced zoning reforms like reduced parking requirements to make it easier for people to run businesses out of their homes. Land use is changing, and that's one of the many reasons it's exciting to be a planner today. Planners who do land use are like gardeners. Without them, cities would grow in a haphazard way with weeds crowding out the flowers. Instead, land use planners plant the seeds of a city they want to see in the future. 